Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, by now, you probably recognize my voice, but this is Courtney Neubauer again with the Division of Nutrition Support. Um, originally, I was asked last week to have a training specifically to explain the local level reimbursement uh, a little more than we did in the, in the monthly call. Well, in the meantime, a, a lot of things have come out and we are hitting the ground running regarding PEBT for 2021. So it made the most sense to do a comprehensive training on both PEBT 2021 and the local level reimbursement. So this training is geared uh, for both, both parts. So the, the, the reimbursement to households and also the local level reimbursement um, that is available to school systems. So to start, we will be discussing the PEBT 2021, and this is simply an introduction. Most of you have probably already heard some information from your data management teams. So your CIS coordinators have been receiving some information. Um, and, and so the, the slides for that portion were borrowed from the uh, training that was provided to the uh, data managers within the school systems. We'll also discuss the local level funding for schools. We'll go through the local level PEBT application. So that funding opportunity for schools, the online application, I'll go over that. I just wanted to mention a few general program reminders and then open the door for any questions and answers. As I'm going through this, if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box and I'll do my best to answer that. Do know that this first section regarding the PEBT introduction, that is being handled by the um, DCFS and also the Office of Technology Services or OTS. So some of those questions I may not be able to answer specifically, but I'll, I'll do the best I can um, based on the questions that are asked. So to start, we will um, start with the pandemic EBT 2021. And so this is regarding the student level PEBT benefits that are being that are that we're preparing to issue in the next few months. So a little bit of background about PEBT. Uh, the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services, so DCFS, in collaboration with the Louisiana Department of Education, have received approval to operate the pandemic EBT program in response to COVID-19 related to school closures. And this most recent approval that has been granted is for school year 2021. PEBT provides food support to help families with children who are learning in either a hybrid or virtual model and were receiving, previously receiving free or reduced price meals. And in order for us to distribute PEBT funding to schools, school district data managers were asked to submit data to the Office of Technology Services by May 21st, which is right around the corner. So you probably already heard from your data manager about this deadline that is uh, creeping up just barely a week away. So an overview of PEBT. PEBT provides supplemental foods, food assistance for students who have temporarily lost access to free or reduced price meals because of COVID-19. For this round of PEBT, there are there, there's a, it's a complicated way of becoming eligible. So when we think back to what happened in March of 2020 and all of our schools closed, um, it was a very sudden middle of March, everything shut down. So there wasn't this hybrid model, this virtual option. Everybody no longer had access to, to meals in the school building. Yes, we had um, curbside services that came up, there were delivery options, but in, in the way that we think of our child nutrition programs, those, those congregate settings in school, kids going to a classroom didn't happen. And so when the issuance of PEBT came out for school year uh, 1920, it was really clean. So everybody lost access. So if you were free or reduced price eligible, or you attended a CEP school, so therefore the entire school um, population became eligible, 
all students received benefits. This year, it is much more complicated than that. And the reason why is because we have situations where children are um, in classrooms every day, just like they were previous uh, prior to COVID. And then we have also subsets of children that are learning in hybrid settings or in completely virtual settings. And so that, that just adds another layer of complexity with determining eligibility for PEBT in school year 2021. So to be eligible, a school campus has to meet all of the following criteria. So first, they have to be a provider of the national school lunch and or school breakfast program. So that's number one. You have to have you have to be on one of the child nutrition programs. Um, if you are a school that traditionally does operate the national school lunch program and you have transitioned to seamless summer or summer feeding, your campus is still eligible. The, but if you are a, a um, private school, and I'm gonna use that for, because most of our public schools do participate. If you're a private school where you've never participated in the national school lunch program, those children are not eligible for PEBT benefits. They weren't eligible last time and they wouldn't be eligible this time. So the school has to be participating in the national school lunch school breakfast program. Um, and in this particular school year, previously had been operating under the National School Lunch Program and may have transitioned to a summer program or seamless summer program. And then secondly, how you have to be, have been closed or have reduced in-person learning hours or attendance for five consecutive instructional days. So, and this, this is looking at, you know, not only the, the school, but also children. So schools that had a 100% in-person education where nobody was given the virtual option did not have closures or reduced in-person learning hours for five consecutive days. But we do know that the majority of the schools in our state that operate the National School Lunch Program did close or have reduced hours for at least a subset of their kids for most of this school year. We still see in many of our school systems virtual learners. So the majority of the kids may have returned to in-person in, in learning, but there is a subset that is still to this day receiving education virtually. So that, that's what we that's where this gets really, really complex. And then secondly, the eligible students have they have to be enrolled in a school that meets the eligibility requirements. And they also have to be eligible for free or reduced price meals. And so to be eligible for reduced, free or reduced price meals, um, they either are attending a CEP school, so the entire population um, becomes free or reduced price eligible based on this criteria, or they, receive, they received free or reduced price meals through either direct certification or an income application um, in a non-CEP participating school. If you don't have statuses on kids for 2021 because they didn't submit an application, there is the ability to look at those statuses from 1920 to determine eligibility. Okay, so kind of try to simplify how a student qualifies for PEBT this round. So there's two separate criteria that have to be determined on a monthly basis to receive benefits. So one, they attend a school that participates in national school lunch program. They qualify for free or reduced price lunch through either direct certification or a free and reduced price lunch application. And then they, or they attend a CEP school. And then second, that student has to have either attended or currently attend school in a hybrid or virtual learning model during the month. Students who only attended school in person during a month would not qualify for this round of PEBT benefits. So this, we will be looking at data down to the student level to determine eligibility. So you may have 75% of your student population that may not qualify because they've been in person, but that other 25% that is learning virtually, 
um, would then be eligible for PEBT. So a little overview of the process. Like I said, this is the process that was shared with data manage managers within the school systems. So they received an email with an MOU that was attached. And this was actually sent um, last week. So Friday is when most of them started receiving this. And the, uh, the webinar was, was on last Thursday. And then from there, they were asked to have signed and submitted, have the superintendent sign and submit that MOU by Monday, May 10th, so this past Monday. From there, the data manager was given access to the, to the had given credentials um, to get onto the uh, portal to submit data. And they were provided information of how to go ahead and submit that information. Then what's happening right now for most of them is they're collecting all of their required data. And then they're gonna go on to this portal and upload that data into the portal. DCFS is then going to validate the data and then DCFS is gonna start mailing out the PEBT cards. Students that do not receive a card will be instructed to check with their school or district to verify eligibility or to update any inaccurate student information. The process for, up, for sending that information, so the secure DMZ Move It portal is what's being used, opened around May 8th. And this portal is an interim solution until they can get a fully functional PEBT administrator portion portal, which should be finalized in June. The updated portal is anticipated to be completed in late June, early July. The updated portal will allow school data managers to fix missing or incorrect student information, request PEBT cards um, from customer service, and also once that portal is launched, DCFS will no notify data managers of any process changes for submitting data and information utilizing the new functionality options. Data managers should update, upload the information as soon as it becomes available, because as additional families request assistance or complete the necessary forms with the schools, and that data can be submitted through the portal. So this is the list. Um, to the, uh, to the data that is being requested on that, that spreadsheet. So the information that was sent to the data managers, these are the data points that are being, um, that, that are being gathered from the schools. So it's first name, middle name, last name, date of birth, student SSN, gender, parish code, mailing address, residential address, local student ID, state student ID, state site code, site name, method of instruction, and the month of enrolled. So this is down to the student level determining eligibility. So there are some kids in a school that will be eligible where there may be other students in that same population that are not eligible based on this, um, the guidance from, from USDA on how the PBT benefits would be issued. So what is the difference for this PEBT? So PEBT this year is using direct certification. So with direct certification, there's no application process and does not require any action by the families. So DCFS is gonna use the data that is provided by the school systems to issue the PEBT benefits. Students will receive a new PEBT card. So if they've lost or thrown away their PEBT card from before, they are okay. They'll get a brand new card this time. And there will be a separate card issued for each eligible student in the household. This means that each student gets their own card with that student's name. 
previously one card was issued for all of the children on one card in the parent or guardian's names. Benefits are being issued retroactively and they'll be in installments that base that back all the, go all the way back to August of 2020. So just this week, so on Tuesday, um, DCFS did release a, um, a flyer with graphics and um, I was hoping to have it linked here by today, but haven't had access to it just yet. Um, they're also going to have some frequently asked questions, other graphics and languages that can be used in newsletters and or social media. I do know that also there was a um, article in one of the local papers uh, I am expecting that there's probably going to be more press releases that are going to come out in the next couple of days. And I do know that texts were sent to um, many families directly from DCFS uh, beginning on Tuesday. So um, this is definitely moving pretty quickly and with a portal that is intended to collect data um, with a, by next week, by the 21st, um, most of your, your data managers are probably running around trying to pull this together um, fairly quickly. So um, like I said, this portion of, of the presentation was meant to provide information. I, I know there are some questions. I'm gonna look and see where I can um, answer and, and then some of them, um, I, if, I, if, if it's a little bit more than what I'm able to answer, then I'll, I'll have to reach out to you or have someone reach out to you to answer that specific question. So um, it is possible for individual students to qualify because they are attending school virtually, um, even though the majority of the kids um, are in-person learners. So unless the entire student population is attending school in person, um, then, then it is possible for just a few or just a handful of the students to qualify um, and, and not necessarily the entire population. Um, this PowerPoint will be posted to the Child Nutrition website and a blast sent out um, later today. So as soon as I um, can get that posted, it will, we will send a blast out on, on that. Um, so if you haven't filled out the MOU, I would suggest that you still go ahead and submit that. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that they will still accept that. We want to have as much of a comprehensive data set um, as possible. So we don't wanna leave out any families. Um, so please go ahead and submit that, that MOU if you haven't done so already. Um, so if you provided meals through grab and go or delivery to your virtual learners, they are still eligible for this PEBT benefit. So if they, um, whether or not they picked up meals um, through grab and go or even delivery, if they were attending school in a virtual setting, they, they, they would be, and, and they are eligible for free and reduced price meals, they would be eligible for the PEBT benefit. So um, there is no need to dig down and determine whether or not those particular virtual students had access to meals or were provided meals. If they're virtual learners um, and they are, are hybrid learners and they are free or reduced price eligible or attending a CEP school, those children would, would be eligible. So, if, if, if someone does ask to fill out a meal application at this time, um, you can still and should still collect that meal application. Though That status though would not be retroactive. So just as with any other application, any other year, um, we can't retroactively approve that back to the beginning of the school year. Um, but I do expect that you will probably get some families that want to go ahead and submit that meal application. Um, and we anticipated that this PEBT benefit would be coming um, at, at some point. So we had encouraged really all year for school systems to still collect those meal applications. I do know that um, families, when they see that they're receiving free meals, probably didn't submit a whole lot of application applications. So, so you probably didn't receive a ton, um, but um, you know, th it was made available throughout the school year had they wanted to submit. But um, as we know, with just about everything else, um, you know, until the moment comes where they, they realize, hey, 
I need, need to do this for this reason, they may not have submitted. So I, I'm a little concerned that you may start getting an influx of families wanting to submit applications, but those applications would be effective um, just as if with normal uh, approval of application deadlines. So we would not be approving those back to the beginning of the school year. I'm trying to read through these questions and answer them. There's a lot of them coming in. So if you are a CEP school, all students would potentially be eligible for PEBT, but it is going to depend on their, their mode of learning. So if they are um, in-person learners at a CEP school, they would not be eligible. But if they are a hybrid or a virtual child at a CEP school, they, they would be eligible. Yeah, so so th this round of PEBT is not solely is not based at all on um, on the last round of PEBT. So whether or not they received benefits last time really doesn't matter. Um, it's going to be based on the qualifications um, for this round of PEBT. Some of them may be the the families that did receive it last time, and some of them may be families that are newly eligible or have changed to maybe a CEP school this year. Um, so there is, um, it, it's not based on application or on whether or not they received PEBT benefits last year. So the, um, each month is looked at individually. So there, for the, the data managers were giving, were given a table to show, um, you know, based on a month, there's roughly X number of days. And if a child attended in person on this many days, then they were considered a, you know, a, a, a hybrid student. If they attended school um, this, you know, this few days, then that would count as a virtual student. So they were given guidance as to where to classify a student, um, you know, based on the number of days in the month. Um, so it's going to be looked at monthly. So each month is looked at individually. So August for different from September. So you may have a child that may have been eligible in August, um, but then was no longer eligible in September. And so that that spreadsheet is meant to look at each student's eligibility on a month by month basis. So these are, this is based on data from school year 2021. So if you now have a student that maybe graduated in May of 2021, if they were in school, um, in school year 2021, then they, they would potentially be eligible if they meet, the, meet this criteria. Um, if there are no virtual learners at all in your school system, then nobody would be eligible for PEBT. So if every single child, um, came to school or was required to come to school every single day, um, they would not be eligible. But you would also want to take into account those situations where they may or may have been an exposure where you closed um, a, a class or part of a class um, or even, um, you know, individual situations where a child was sent home um, because of, of personal exposure. So I know firsthand that we, we successfully closed down an entire third grade class, second grade class, as well as sent home very many fifth graders when our own personal struggles with COVID. So um, I think about those types of situations that have probably popped up in most, most schools across the state. Um, so I so, said, um, you know, you'll want to take that into account when you're looking at virtual learners as well. So if they went one semester virtual and one semester in person, then you um, you look at that once again by the month. And so 
um, the months that they were in person, that that particular child would not be eligible. The months that the, that they were virtual, they would look, they would be eligible if they were free and reduced price eligible or in a CEP school. Um, I, I would expect that the benefits would have to be used in Louisiana, um, in stores in Louisiana, being it, it is. Um, it is a, a, a state card, but that, that particular question would probably be best directed to DCFS um, on, on how to use that. Yeah, so if you went virtual one day a week, two days a week, those particular days where you were virtual, those kids that were um, C, either in CEP schools or free and reduced would be eligible. So it, it's all going to, you, you have to look at the attendance of school um, for that particular um, uh, month. So how, you know, whether or not that child was enrolled um, at a certain point in the, the month, we, you'd want to look at how many days they were in attendance or virtual to determine eligibility. There will be some guidance that comes out from, from DCFS as well as um, data management, um, uh, I mean, uh, as well as our uh, Office of Technology Services to help try to answer some of these questions um, for the district. So um, I, I, do, I do think that you will probably start getting inundated with questions fairly quickly. Um, so uh, the website that DCFS has, um, has, has published is www.pebt-la.org, uh, and there are many questions that can be answered um, from that website, so I would encourage families to look at that for information as well. So like I said, that's wwwpebt dash la.org. And that is the website that has been um, published by DCFS to answer questions. Yeah, so if you do receive applications, like I said, we cannot um, retroactively approve applications back to the beginning of the school year. So those applications would have to um, be effect um, just like um, the, the, the other um, you know, any other year. So they would not be able to retroactively be approved back to the beginning of the school year. I am sending the email, the website um, in, in the chat box now. So hopefully, um, like I said, this, this just recently, was released, but it's um, www.pebt-la.org. So I am going to jump to local level reimbursement now that I've hopefully answered the majority of questions. I hated to jump into this topic and not fully try to answer as much as I could um, from the, the first portion since they are a little bit different. Um, but we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the the PEBT local level funding. Uh, and so, yes, there the what you as what what PEBT what DCFS did with PEBT is there is a funding amount for a virtual child and there's a funding amount for a hybrid child. And so, um, whether a child attended you know two days a month or you know three days a month, it's gonna, it's not gonna vary, um, you know, child by child. So they're, they're gonna be classified as either virtual or hybrid or in-person. And so the dollar amount will vary between a virtual and a hybrid child, but it won't necessarily vary from one hybrid child to the next hybrid child based on the number of days the child was in attendance. And so all of that dollar amount is on the, um, the website that I just sent, so move it over here. So if it's a hybrid student, they're gonna get 48.23 per month. If it's a fully virtual learner, they will get 120.71 per month. month. All right, so now PEBT local level reimbursement. So um, 
as we're, we just talked about all of the additional work that is happening over the next few weeks, um, that is what this grant is meant to assist with. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that and see if maybe this can, can help um, support some of the activities that you're having to do over the next couple of, of weeks. Um, and I do know that even though there may be money available, sometimes there's not the people to do the work, and so it becomes very difficult. Um, but but if we can try to think of a way that this grant can help to alleviate, um, you know, some of your stress, then then you know try try to see that that's that's what this is intended for. So in addition to the benefits that are awarded directly to families, USDA has made funding available to all operators of the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program that are responsible for activities related to the FY 2021 state pandemic electronic benefit transfer or PEBT. So even though DCFS is responsible for the, um, the issuance of the PEBT cards um, and OTS is handling the transfer of the data, LDOE, so us who are at uh, the Division of Nutrition Support, are responsible for providing funding to schools for uh, public, charter, and private schools um, for this particular grant, this local level funding for schools. So FY 2021 PEBT, um, there are activities that occur anytime between October 2020 and September 2021 in conjunction to PEBT benefits that were issued during school year 2020 and 2021 or the summer of 2021. So just um, districts that opted into seamless summer or summer food service uh, in place of national school lunch program due to COVID are also eligible. So when we think about these activities, um, you know, We've kind of all moved past the, the issuance of PEBT for school year 1920, that's over. So what happened in June of last year, what happened in August of last year, that is not what this grant is intended to support. What this grant is intended to support are benefits for school year 2021. So prior to the end of last week, the only thing that had happened in school year 2021 related to PEBT was one, tiny little survey that was completed until this week. So now this week, there's a lot of work that has gone into starting to pull this data. You are um, probably starting to get inundated with calls. You are starting to process applications that are strictly related to PEBT issuance. Um, so these are activities that we're trying to target. So um, this, this, this funding opportunity is coming at a perfect time because it's right on the forefront of your brain. So you can, at this point, plan to you know, invoice these types of, of, of activities. You can um, you know, keep very detailed timesheets for additional, for these staff members that are, that are answering calls that are running almost a call center. You can um, quantify the applications that you're processing related to PEBT. So this helps that right now we're talking about this because you're able to think forward about what you, how, how to quantify this and, 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 and keep this, this information separate from um, everything else that we do that may make it eligible for this particular grant opportunity. So PEBT local level funding is, is, is not limited to just a specific school department or unit. So it's not just child nutrition that um, that is eligible for this grant. So if your um, data manager is 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 you know putting in time that can be dedicated to this project, those those hours you know could be used for payment strictly from you know reimbursement from this grant later on down the road. So. It's a limited salary of personnel, so we're not trying to pay salaries of every staff member, but if there's particular people or you've pulled staff to simply to handle this, this function and you've put someone else in their role somewhere else, you could use those hours um, for reimbursement. If there's equipment costs, um, any kind of system updates that you may be doing, uh, support services, so if you you know, have a simplified call center where you're answering questions. If you're hiring an, a, 
temp to put into one of your schools to serve as a cook so you can pull um, one of your more experienced staff members out to help answer phones. I mean, th be creative, but if there are things um, that that you need um, related to this grant, um, to, this, to the PBT issuance, these are the things that are meant to, uh, this grant is meant to support. And also supply costs and indirect costs. So some other more specific examples would be the reporting of student level or school level learning models, designated staff that are responsible to parent requests and questions, collecting and processing school meal applications specifically to establish eligibility for PEBT, and then additional work that may come up um, from DCFS related to SNAP or PEBT issuance. These, is, these examples are not meant to be exhaustive and other items can be approved so you, um, you know, as long as they are designed to administer the PEBT program for FY 2021. Um, it could be, um, you know, uh, flyers that you've printed that you're sending home to, to families related to PEBT. Uh, so, so kind of anything related to the issuance of these benefits is what, where, what would, would fit into this category. So unallowable costs or costs that are not um, necessary or responsible for the administration of the FY21 PEBT. So expenses already reimbursed under another federal award cannot be, you, so you cannot charge two funding sources for the same expenses. So you can't charge both USDA PEBT funding and also child nutrition grant funding for the same expense. And then costs incurred for 2020 PEBT benefits are not to be included. And so PEBT uh, FY 2020 are um, the PEBT benefits that were issued in June and then the second round in um, early, in late August, early September of last year, um, which were intended for school year 1920. So those, those PEBT benefits are not to be included in this grant opportunity. So maintaining documentation for this, so all program related costs must be documented and supportable. SFAs must keep a record of all PEBT incurred costs at the local level. And as with any program costs, these are subject to administrative review, management evaluation, financial management review, and they can also be reviewed as part of an audit by our department and also any other department. So be prepared for this to be audited by anybody, including OIG, LDOE, or even USDA. So I'm gonna talk about this slide, which has a deadline of May 28th. And before you panic, um, just, just kind of let out, I think that for most of us, the, the second collection period of, of August is gonna make more sense. But um, the first deadline for collection is May 28th. So, you all are completely scrambling, pulling this data um, that is due the 21st, and now you've just been told that there's another deadline of May 28th. So just breathe and let me get through the next two slides before you, 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 you hit me with too many questions related to this new deadline that's, that's two weeks away. So PEBT, local level funding for schools, um, there is an application that is due through our website and they, we are collecting the reimbursements um, in two intervals, May of 2021 and August of 2021. Okay, so that is a requirement of USDA that there be two intervals. So the first deadline is May 28th. And the period of this reporting is for October 1 of 2020 through May 31st of 2021. We're gonna start reimbursing schools in June. And then all of these requests must be submitted no later than May 28th of 2021. So any funds that are not requested in this May collection can be collect, put, included in the August collection. So 
if you're right now in the middle of this, you, you can't quite figure out what it's going to require you to do. You're not ready to jump into knowing, okay, this is what I need to do for you to printing of, of flyers. I'm not sure if, you know, if I can throw together a call center, what is that going to look like? Don't panic. You don't have to submit anything by May 28th and you can get all your ducks in a row and submit for August. So no reason to panic. If you, you, this deadline is here, you absolutely can submit something for the May 28th deadline. But if you're worried about what that looks like and all these other timelines that you have, you can request any, you know, all the way back to August, went to October of, of 2020 in the August submission. So our second interval will be August of 2021. So we don't have an exact date of when that's coming, but August, 2021. And the exact date is to be determined. Funds requested in August should include any reimbursement needs that you are planning to incur through September of 2021. So you'll have to think ahead, but by then I think we'll be really rolling with this issuance. And so you will have known what you've already spent and you'll have an idea of what you would need through September by, by that August deadline. So to submit the PEBT form, it is on our website. The first collection for SFAs is open now and you can submit that through our website. Um, whenever you are ready. We also posted a memo this week about this. Um, so that is, if I can find it quickly for you. Um, it had instructions on how to submit the application. And it is memo number SFS 21-166, it looks like this. And so it has some basic, basic instructions as well as that deadline and then some screenshots as well of how to um, complete the application. So uh, the PEBT application is available on our website. It's under the green school food service tab. On the green sidebar, you'll click PEBT cost grant. From there, you'll see a screen like this. You'll click the little blue start button. Then you'll get to a page that looks like this where you'll enter in the cumulative costs associated with each of the categories listed here. Salaries, equipment, system costs, support services, contracts, supplies, or indirect costs. And from there, you need to make sure that you have all of the documentation um, to support those amounts. It'll also give you a grand total at the bottom. Um, do know that we are going to ask for the backup to support this, so make sure you have everything um, in order before you submit. From there, you'll click submit on this website, this page. It'll bring you to this next page, which will show you the total funding amount that you're requesting. This is a very short time frame, so please make sure you have proper um, your proper invoices. When we request those, we will you will be given a date by which you have to submit that to us. If we don't receive that, then we will have to withdraw the request. You'll then need to um, click that that you agree to all the terms and conditions that that have been that are required of you by LDOE, Child Nutrition, USDA, and any other regulations. You will have to attest that you are an employee and authorized rep of the, the organization, and you will need to acknowledge that failure to submit an invoice in a timely matter will effectively withdraw your request. And from there, you'll, you'll click Submit, and then you're done. So super, super easy. Um, I'm now going to just briefly talk about a few general program reminders that have come up over the last few weeks, and then I'm going to go and try to answer a few more um, questions. So.
So we also issued a memo this week regarding multi-day distribution. So the nationwide non-congregate feeding, the mealtime flexibility, and the parent pickup um, allow service of multiple meals at one time during the pandemic. Previous guidance indicates that states can approve a distribution or pickup approach that includes meals for multiple days, but that's up to one week maximum at a time. And so when we were on National School Lunch School Breakfast Program, that was a five-day issuance. And when we moved into summer, seamless summer and CACFP, those guidelines allow four weekends and holidays. So it's a maximum of seven days of meals for those particular programs. We have confirmed this guidance again with USDA um, this week, and they have confirmed that this uh, still remains appropriate for summer 2021, as well as for school year 21-22. Addition, um, just a reminder that a maximum of two meal types can be served per site under seamless summer or summer feeding. Flexibility was given in school year 2021 and also planned for school year 21-22 to allow a third or even a fourth meal. And so we, they've allowed for, you know, the summer and seamless summer with these two meals to also um, allow for snack and or supper under uh, either national school lunch or C CACFP, but per USDA during the summer, so traditional summer or using C uh, seamless summer during the traditional summer months, that flexibility is not available. So it is a maximum of two meal types for each site during traditional summer operations. Additionally, it's not included here, um, but our monthly call will move to the first Tuesday of the month, starting in June. So that information will be posted um, with the June uh, trainings that are coming up, uh, coming out probably later today or tomorrow. The June trainings are open on the Pennington website uh, today. And just be aware that moving forward, starting in June, the uh, monthly call will move to the first Tuesday of the month instead of the first Thursday. I'm gonna try to go back and answer some more of these questions and see how I can um, hopefully help a little bit. So um, the, the PEBT local level reimbursement is on the fiscal year, which is October 1 through September 30th, but it's meant to support activities that are related to school year um, 2021 uh, and also summer 2021. So for um, our purposes, kind of, I guess the easiest way to think about it is um, since we didn't have PEBT activities that occurred in the beginning of this school year, um, is to really think about the PEB activities that maybe started um, in roughly January um, of 2021. Um, Cause that, that, I believe it was February when the first survey went out to ask districts, um, it was February or March, ask districts about their, um, their learning models. And so think about activities back to that point and then basically through this coming summer. Um, so the grant is technically October 1, 2020 through September 30th of 2021. Um, but like I said, it, it becomes, it's, you've got all these different timeframes that kind of fall into the same period, but the, the local level reimbursement is on the fiscal year. Um, I, I would expect that there will be updates to data that will need to be done after that um, May 21st deadline. Just as with last time, I remember what, you know, the PEBT work that was done last time, and there were a lot of changes that did come after that initial um, collection period. So, uh, 
CNP uh, child nutrition program, so the Division of Nutrition Support is handling the local level reimbursement. Um, so the only people that have access to our, our website um, are child nutrition staff. So uh, we are asking that you, as the child nutrition director, uh, coordinate any activities that may be happening within your school district with, related to PEBT that you appear that, that appear to be eligible for this reimbursement and, and kind of help coordinate getting that that the invoices and the backup to support that. And then you would be responsible for submitting that application for reimbursement. So we um, we are the, the, the entity responsible for that, that grant. So that is going through our website. So um, please uh, coordinate with um, your district um, and, and you as the child nutrition director uh, plan on submitting that grant uh, for the district as a whole through our website. So we, um, we did provide this information about the local level reimbursement. Um, it will be going out in uh, the, the superintendent's newsletter next week um, so that, that the superintendents are made aware of this opportunity. So um, we've also posted information on our website, but uh, that will be going to the superintendent's office effective next, next week. So there are a lot of questions about submitting this. So it is through our website. So child nutrition would need to submit it, but you, you can and should include activities related to PEBT that may not necessarily be occurring with child nutrition staff. So if there are other um, entities, data management, your SIS department, you know, just, you know, the, the superintendent's office, whoever's assisting with getting this information complete, um, you would submit those activities on their behalf through this application. Local level funding is, um, is, is related to activities that are related to PEBT. So the gathering of student information, submitting the reports, um, notifying families of eligibility, providing flyers, maintaining a call center, so just a, a wide range of things. So DCFS is doing the actual issuance of the card. So this is related to any activities that are supporting the, those, those issuance of the benefit. So, and that could be just managing a call center when those questions come in from districts. So that, that may be um, what comes in. So this is strictly related to activities related to PEBT. So extra um, pay for staff that are providing meals um, at sites would not be eligible for reimbursement under this grant. So currently the PEBT plans are, um, are meant to go retroactive to the start of this school year. Um, at this time, I don't have information as to how PEBT or if there will be, be PEBT to cover the, um, the, the summer months. Any other questions? I think I've tried to answer just about all of them. Um, uh, if, if you have any other questions, feel free to, um, to put, it, put those in the chat box. Um, I will have this PowerPoint posted on our child nutrition website a, a little bit later um, uh, today. So PEBT is going to be issued all the way back to the beginning of the school year, which is August of 2020. Um, and we will, um, but the, the local level reimbursement is operating on the fiscal year. And so that will be um, starting October. So the, the benefits to the households will go back to August, but the local level reimbursement is meant to, to reflect activities that began in October, which 
should not be an issue since we have not really had any PEBT activities that would have happened between August and September for this particular, this particular grant period. Uh, so we will, once this training is complete, uh, we will also post the recorded version and the slides on Louisiana Fit Kids. Um, so it is, I'll show you where they'll be. If you go to louisianafitkids.com and go to training and go to training slides, you'll see a, a list of all of the trainings that we have. And you can, uh, it's currently not here because it hasn't been posted just yet because we haven't finished, um, but it'll be here at the top and it'll say the, the name of today's training and there'll be a link to the slides and also a link that'll take you to YouTube where you can watch the recording of this for this, this um, training. Okay. Any other questions? And like I said, this the start of this presentation with the PEBT um, and, and the, the documents, the do data that was to be submitted through your data manager, um, that was meant to be for, um, for informational purposes. So uh, there are probably many questions that I cannot answer, um, but I've tried to at least provide a, an overview for all of you so you have an idea of what's being asked. Of, of your data coordinators, um, because oftentimes that data comes from our free and reduced price meal applications. And so um, that they may be looking to you for some answers. So that um, hopefully that provides you a nice overview and there will be more information that is coming to them. Um, and as that happens, um, you know, we, we will try to provide that information to you as quickly as possible, but this is moving fairly, fairly quickly. Um, so there may be plenty of information that, that is given directly to them that, um, that we have not been able to provide out to you just yet. But please reach out if you have any other questions and um, we'll see you all on um, the, our next training, which is this, the, I believe there's the summer training on the 25th. Uh, for those that are up for review. And then our next monthly call will be on Tuesday, June 1st. Um, there's also a few other trainings in there, but those are the ones that are coming to mind right now. So definitely um, look for all of you on Tuesday, June 1st.